Welcome to the Painter Marketing Mastermind Podcast, a show created to help painting company owners build a thriving painting business that does well over $1 million in annual revenue. I'm your host, Brandon Pierpont, founder of Painter Marketing Pros and creator of the popular PCA educational series, Learn, Do, Grow, Marketing for Painters. In each episode, I'll be sharing proven tips, strategies, and processes from leading experts in the industry on how they found success in their painting business. We will be interviewing owners of the most successful painting companies in North America and learning from their experiences. In this series, titled ZK's Words of Wisdom, Zach Kenny of ZK Painting will be discussing how he has overcome mistakes, best practices for serving high-end clientele, and social media marketing greatness. In episode one, Zach discussed the many failures and subsequent learnings and adaptations he had to make on his journey to over $3 million per year in revenue. In this episode, episode two, Zach will dive into how to best serve high-end customers given their somewhat unique needs and expectations. And in episode three, Zach will cover his keys to social media marketing greatness and how your painting company can begin implementing these tactics today. If you wanna ask Zach questions related to anything in this podcast series, you can do so on our exclusive Painter Marketing Mastermind Podcast Forum on Facebook. Just search for Painter Marketing Mastermind Podcast Forum on Facebook and request to join the group or type in the URL, facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash Painter Marketing Mastermind. Again, that URL is facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash Painter Marketing Mastermind. There you can ask Zach questions directly by tagging him with your question so you can see how anything discussed here applies to your particular painting company. What's going on, Zach? Hey, Brandon, how are you? Doing well, man. I enjoyed our last conversation. And I know we were kind of heading into this topic in depth. We had to pull it back. So I'm excited for what we got today. Me too. High-end clientele. Let's do uh, maybe like a, a quick recap before we dive full in on kind of how you ended up working with your target market. And then we can get into what makes it so different. Yeah, I think I, I was always driven by the craft and um, <clears throat> being able to deliver a high quality product. And I think that was really the driver. And then eventually I realized like, wait a second, you, if you're going to sell paint jobs that cost more, you got to find people who want to pay for them. And just naturally, you know, the high end market became like where I was going to go work because I wanted to do the highest level paint jobs possible. I didn't get into this business to like make the most amount of money. Um, it wasn't really what I was thinking about as much of just like, I really love the craft and like, how can I, you know, flex that muscle? I love it, man. So for you, it was a, basically a passion drove your positioning in the marketplace. hundred percent. Awesome. And now are you still doing the paint? Are you still I, out there? I haven't painted in about five years. But how does that reflect on your, I guess, is that passion for the craft? Um, relevant. You can only do too much, so much with two hands. And right. I realized at a certain point, uh, so now I, I get not as much, but almost as much satisfaction, um, okay. from seeing the projects that we're on. A lot of what I do now is in the, is in the designing the scope of work and designing the process for, for getting an outcome and then coaching up and supporting my team and, and executing that. So I still am involved in the craft. I'm not sanding a door for 30 hours like I used to. Yeah. Um, and I do miss a fair amount of it, but I teach classes. And so that's kind of where I get to really, where I get my hands dirty is, you know, every couple of months we have an in-person class at my shop. And so I still get to like touch the tools and the equipment and sand and all the things. But now I get to do large scale projects with high-end designers and contractors and awesome clients and like now it's not i did this it's we did this I love and it. Like, you know and i get to a lot of my satisfaction now comes from like my the people who work with us make good money and they have a good living and you know they're happy people and they're not being like stressed out and worried and and it, it's not a toxic environment to go to work in you know i've definitely shifted um what i've like like rate myself on what am i trying to do like we got to the painting like we we know how to do good painting yeah i love it man you've you've up upscaled kind of in some ways to the point where now you're able to to focus on things outside of the actual 
craft itself. The craft is still being done really well, but now you're actually impacting people's lives, your team members' lives in a really positive way. And you're you're seeing more impact than just the craft itself at this point. Yeah, I'm a I'm a I love to learn. I'm a very curious person and I really love learning and growing and and I'm I'm the guy, I'm the I get the ball rolling and then I lose interest. So like I've learned to harness that. Um and I think at a certain point I learning the craft was like all encompassing. It it fed my soul and I was all in and I was reading the forums till 3 a.m. every night and I was practicing and trying and I was obsessed. But at a certain point, like I kind of figured some stuff out and it became more monotonous and less interesting. Um, and so I had, and then I, I was sick of being broke. And so I started, I said, I'm not going to touch the paintbrush anymore. And then you start to have a whole new set of like problems and growing and learning and and the feedback loop and it's running a business and then scaling quality are a new thing that keeps me super interested. Yeah. So we talked a little bit last time about the size of your projects. You know, I, I think you had mentioned a painting a front door for eight thousand dollars, but let's kind of just quickly touch on that again. Yeah. Um, as we start this kind of who you serve typical typical size of your projects how long they last all that kind of stuff yeah so our like our flagship product i guess the thing that kind of through social media got us um some attention was our high gloss doors they're very instagram and video um i don't know the word they they, they do well on social media they're easy to capture um and show and highlight and people get it uh, when I show high gloss rooms, I think people don't even have a clue what they're seeing and, and they don't do nearly as well. People don't understand them. They take a lot longer to get done. So it's funny like high gloss rooms and ceilings really don't show the same way. So we do a lot of entry doors. That's why I first started using gloss. First thing I ever put gloss on was an entry door. Um, you can take it to your shop. You can lay it down. You can do it in a way. And and so we do quite a few high gloss doors. Um, and yes, we, I can't do a high gloss door for less than $7,000. Like, unless we started getting slabs, if we get slabs or we do scale, I have like 30 doors that we're doing. And so there's a efficiencies of scale there where we can be closer to like 5,500. Um, and if we had flat slabs, you know, I could be less than that. Cause it's the hand sanding that takes all the time. Machine sanding is fast. Um, but then our site work. We rarely do anything under $10,000 on site. Um, that's a small project for us. Um, most of our projects are going to be um, 40 to, it, it's going to start around 40,000, but a lot of six figure interiors. Um, that's not uncommon. Uh, we just finished up a, you know, well over $150,000 interior. We did a $100,000 one for her early, a couple of years earlier. I'm pricing out a couple of like three to six hundred thousand dollar projects right now. Wow. Um big lot of labor, um, a lot of scheduling and manpower, and and it's they get very complex. And it took me a long time to figure out how to do those types of projects. Um they're they're not as simple as like, oh, I know how to do one room, just do it times 30. Like it's just not how it works. And I lost a lot of money on a lot of projects early on because you don't really get a lot of efficiencies of scale when you, when you grow on a high-end project. Cause most of the time, no one's giving you the whole house. Mm. It's definitely, um, cust the custom world is like, it's different when people start to pay this kind of money. Uh, we, I just say, we just say yes all the time. I say, yes, 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 yes. And we change and we adapt and we, you know, and then the price reflects but i'm in the business of saying yes to people and like making their whatever they want to happen happen and however they want it we're going to do it so if they're asking for something that you maybe haven't really done before you'll say yes and figure it out and then price it to a point that makes sense generally um yeah and and before we do it we're going to do full-scale samples in the shop we never try something new on projects yeah um, we're going to do it in the shop, but yeah, I'm going to say, yes, I can do that. I'm going to find the guys that's, that are great at it. Then we're going to go do mock-ups in the shop and, and, you know, 
all the things that take a lot of time and money. I, I when I took the mental when I took the shackles of price off of the the sales and sort of listened to a client and never said no. I just said yes, but you know, I I need caveats of like price or like I need the place to myself or, you know, whatever. I'm going to ask for some stuff and I'm going to advocate. A lot of what I do now is advocate for the paint job mm. and advocate for the process because GCs and clients are like, go, 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 hurry up, hurry up, hurry up. And uh, it's not easy when someone's telling you, you know, you, we want a lot of us, I got into this because I'm a people pleaser and uh, I did a lot of people pleasing at the expense of my paint jobs at the expense of my budgets, my bottom line. Um, and so now we we sort of we have some a lot more experience and we can say like no here's what we need to do to give you what you said you want. Yeah, and the ironic thing is you try to please people, but it doesn't really work when you're trying to please people that way. And so if you're if you're kind of moving along or, or you're trying to be expedited or, or do it however they're you know whatever box they're trying to put you in, but then there's an issue of some kind which is clearly caused because you were trying to meet all these demands that issue is going to be the problem. There's not going to be any, well, thanks for trying, you know, thanks for doing that. It's going to be, Hey, you suck. You messed up X, Y, or Z. We have this very important moment that, Oh man, I wish I could have learned this. And we talked about this. We should have talked about this yesterday, but there's this very important moment where we set expectations. And if we are setting expectations, just like when you estimate, like you shouldn't estimate for best practice, like no matter, like this is, if everything goes perfect, here's how much it'll cost. Yeah. Right. I learned that the hard way. That's how I price things for a long time. You know, it, when you set expectations, this is the time, right? And and it, there's tension when you set expectations with the client. And I'm a people pleaser and I have to get used to this tension and live through it because the pain later is so great. And if if I have a client who goes, okay, like how long is it going to take to have my gloss room painted? This is the time where I set the expectation. And if I say four to six weeks, and they give me pushback. And then I go, mm, I mean, maybe we could do it in three and a half. That's that's where so many of my problems have come, right? In, instead, it's a, it's a fascinating human psychology experiment where that person, you tell them four to six weeks. In their head, they thought it was two weeks because they're not painters, right? And there's a tension in the room. There's a tension inside of them. They're And they're like processing it and they're trying to poke. And oftentimes we negotiate against ourselves. I did. I was very bad at negotiating against myself. And in that tension and silence period, when the client was sort of like, uh, I would start to backtrack and negotiate against myself where they didn't even open up their mouth yet. But the tension and the the silence in the room made me go. uh, And then next thing you know, I've committed to something that I can't do. So today I'm, I'm, try very hard and I'm not perfect and definitely still make this mistake, but like, Hey, it's four to six weeks and then shut the fuck up. Just, can I swear? Shut up. Um, just shut up and don't, and and like stick to your guns. I had a really painful experience with a client that I loved some of my, two of my best clients. They were amazing people. And we were doing, it was the biggest project I'd ever done. It was a big exterior restoration. We had I did a bunch of things wrong, but we had a bunch of scaffolding and and we stripped all the house and we, but we got to the point where like, and I told him, I don't know how long it's going to take. I've never done something this big. I was honest up front, but I'll never forget. There was this meeting and it was on an evening one night and I go to sit down and it's the two of the nicest human beings in the world. And I was like, I went to this meeting to tell them that I need to leave their house in primer over the winter. And I left that meeting agreeing to paint the house before the end of winter because I was a people pleaser and the people are very kind and very nice. And I just wanted to make them happy. And I wasn't confident enough to say no. Well, I then tented off this place. I ran heaters at night. I did everything until a rainstorm came and my six mil plastic that was like making a tent on my giant scaffolding had a ceiling to it. And then it rained and like 60 gallons of water were sitting on the top of this scaffolding six mil plastic thing I had In the middle of the night, I was trying to get water down from it and running up and down till the sun came up, trying to get water out. And eventually the client and the client heard me run up and down scaffolding all night. And finally that morning, they were just like, get out of our house, leave our house. You're done. I can't stand this. You've made this so painful. Uh, Leave. And I didn't get to finish that project. And somebody else got to come and put the final coats on that project and stick their sign in the yard. And that was so painful because we had put 
hundreds and hundreds of hours stripping lead paint, like the gross stuff. And if I had just gone and stuck to my guns and said, we're going to leave it in primer over the winter and come back and paint it just like some other guy did later. But it's like advocating and sticking to what the project, to what you know needs to happen. Clients will back to like clients will like process process and go, okay, it's just paint. Like at the end of the day, everything we're talking about is just paint. It's like people will go, okay, four to six weeks, like give them time to process and come to this new reality. And then, then busy people want to put something in their head and forget about it. Like, okay, this is over here. It's doing this thing. And now I don't have to think about it. And I think that's really, you're talking about high-end clients and how to serve them. We need to be that thing that they can like deal with process and then put away and never worry about again. I think a lot of what I sell is low risk. We're not, you don't have to worry about us. Yeah. Um, what is that worth to somebody that's a high net worth individual or, or someone that's very busy and has a lot going on and their, their hourly rate when they go to work is worth a lot. Well, now it makes it a good idea to spend a little more to have no mental energy spent on worrying if the painter's going to show up today or if the painter's going to whatever. Um, meet, it's a, again, the first time this client we just finished up the project with, um, she had just gone through a horrible renovation with the GC and they were exhausted. And she was like, I will pay extreme premium to have this job done very fast. And we did a full restoration of two rooms in two weeks. And it was exorbitantly expensive. Could have been done for almost half the cost if we had more time, but we delivered. And she was like, couldn't believe it, right? Because she, we just did what we said we were going to do. Yeah. But I think setting those expectations up front realistically, because if you say four to six weeks and you get done in three and a half, you're a hero. Yep. But if you say four to six weeks and you get done in, in, if you say three and a half weeks and you get done in four weeks, you're an asshole. And that final bill is going to come and it's going to be a lot harder to get. And that blue tape, we talked about this in the last episode, but the sommelier effect, the, the, the wine is going to taste different in the back alley in a Dixie cup. And if I've missed my deadline by even a couple days, that wine's now being drank in a, in a back alley in a Dixie cup. The, the paint job will not look the same. And I'll have to do more touch-ups. It's likely I'll do more touch-ups when I miss my deadline than if I just set up a farther deadline in the past. And it's that me, that time when you set the expectations. Uh, oh, man, I'm saying this so much because I need to remember it because yeah. it's still a thing that's hard to do in the moment. Yeah, no, it's it's so important too. And it is so easy, <clears throat> you know, as you're selling stuff and like a painter marketing pros, we try to under promise and over deliver. And it's so common for, you know, agencies, they want to hype, like we're going to get you a million leads, right? Million leads that you sign, man, you won't even, you'll never have to worry about your business again. Right. And for painting companies, they want to say best paint job in the world. You know, you're never going to have to worry about it again. And and it's kind of the marketing kind of place to that. You make a portfolio and what are you going to put in your portfolio? It's going to be your most beautiful projects. You're not going to put your mid tier or the one you kind of screwed up. That's not going to go in your portfolio, your testimonials, your reviews, that's going to be good stuff. But when it gets down to actually talking to the homeowner, to talking to the person that you're selling it to people buy on trust. So if you tell them that, Hey, you're the, the greatest thing since sliced bread, the reality is you're probably not because there are tons of other painting companies, but you might be a solid dialed in company that has ethics that stands behind its work that has plenty of people they can talk to plenty of projects they can show yeah they've made mistakes but they've made it right here's the process here's realistically how long it's going to take and why and no i can't create a unicorn for you because you want it because because it doesn't work but what i can do is tell you that when i do it in this timeline it's going to be done right and it's it's as hard as it is it's a lot easier to have that conversation then than to have to have the one that you had you know when you're trying to trying to get the water off the tarp and it's the middle of the night and you're in their house. That's, that's a much more difficult conversation, but it's so easy to just postpone the pain. You know, you just want to, you want to get rid of the discomfort right now, but you're setting yourself up for failure. Yeah. And I, and I think it, to another part of this is like a lot of us, I mean, I probably did this because, and I'd still, I, I'll lose jobs when I set the honest expectations and the client's like, I lost it. I lost a gloss ceiling and it had nothing to do with price. It was a $30,000 gloss ceiling and uh, the timeline was not okay with them. Yeah. And there's nothing I can do. I'm like, it, I can't do it any faster. I know this. I've done this enough times. I'm not going to sacrifice and tell you I can do this any faster than I possibly can. 
And I think a big part of this is like having good marketing is like, like we talked about yesterday, demand needs to far out way supply. Yeah. So I can and look at doesn't. somebody and go, no, I'm yeah. not this. I'm going to stand my ground and say, like I said, advocate for the paint job. Yeah. Here's what needs to happen. And if you don't like it, I totally get it. I'm not here to tell you, you have to have this gloss ceiling. And that, that ability today where I can look at a project and I don't need to win it. I think that the number one thing in business for all painters is that you got to get to a spot where you do not need to win that project when you look at it. That's how we charge the most. That's how we get, ha that's honestly how we get happy clients. Yeah. And when you come in with that, that kind of hold your ground, that kind of, Hey, we're the professionals, we're the experts. You're hiring, up, hiring us because we're good at what we do. It just sets the tone for the relationship to be positive for them, not to try to kind of ride you the whole, the whole way, try to get free stuff, try to have nitpick every little thing and, and overlook over your shoulder because you've set yourself up as a professional and the expert and you're being hired for that expertise and you losing that project, you know, the $30,000 loss ceiling, that seems like a loss on the surface. It's actually a huge win, which I'm sure, you know, but I want to make sure everyone we're listening, you know, who's listening to this, that's a huge win. And sometimes no is what you want. No's are great because a no from the, the wrong customer, from the customer that was going to have a real problem that that ceiling wasn't complete. And then no matter how beautiful it was, there was going to be a negative review or, you know, who knows what came out of it. That's a, a bullet that was dodged. So not every project, not every estimate you go to, not every person you talk to is a fit. And you, you have to accept that and be happy that you avoided a mistake. Cause right there, that was a mistake that you avoided. Yeah. The no's are so powerful. You know, the no's are where it's at, man. It took me a long time to figure that out. And even in sales in general, even for the projects you want, you know, there, there's the, the idea that every, every no, you're one no closer to a yes, you know, when you're making a sale. So even if a project you want, there's a learning opportunity. Business and successes of all kind are built on no's. The yeah. yeses are, are kind of the, the anomaly through, a, through a, a, you know, a graveyard of failures and mistakes and no's and everything. That's how real, real success is built ultimately. Um, you said another thing too, that was really important. I think it, it's super, super relevant when you're talking about these really high net worth individuals is hourly cost. So opportunity cost, you know, you, you go in and if you can provide them that peace of mind, this goes for everybody, but for these extremely wealthy individuals, they're going to be especially um, attuned to how much time they're spending on something. You have to think about what bandwidth in their mind you are freeing up by the fact that you have a guarantee or you have a, a you know, you can give them that peace of mind, that satisfaction, them knowing that you were taking care of it, you're freeing up bandwidth. And that in and of itself, there's a very high monetary value that's going to be placed on that. Yeah. It's again, like what we talked about, it's like, you got to think for these, for your client, put your head in, put your brain in the, in the position of your client. And like, you know, I'm not my client and I probably never will be. So I need to, like, I can't look at my life and the people I hang out with and like compare what they, how they make decisions and then put that onto my client. Like, no, I need to get in the headspace of, of the people I work for, listening to the feedback that they give, like trying to be empathetic for what is it like to be a day in their life and then build a machine that serves them. Yeah. I think that's, that's kind of what I've done decently well is like, understanding what, what matters to people. Yeah. So let's get into the, you know, we, we've kind of danced around it a lot, but, but let's maybe do some comparing contrasting. So the typical painting company, you know, 5,000, 6,000, 8,000, whatever it is, their standard paint, paint size for their projects versus, you know, you're talking about hundreds of thousands, half a million dollars for some of your projects. What are the differences? Um, I mean, at, at a very base level, um, you're, you're, just going to, it's all time. I mean, the pricing, a lot of our pricing is just coming from sheer number of hours that that's where most of the price of a paint job comes from. Um, so we are going to do, we're definitely going to do a lot more labor on any given substrate, right? Um, there are, it's budget expectations talking about it all the time. What What's your budget versus your expectations and they need to align. And so we're going to find a way to make them align, whether we reduce scope or you increase your budget. Um, but if you have a certain expectation, I, I, I'm going to tell you how we can get there. Um, I think so at, at a base base level, the first thing is like, yeah, the paint job has to be really good. Um, but, but I think crafts people, the, the crafts 
guys out here, women, men and women, like we probably overestimate how important the paint job is in the equation for a high end client. Um, in the sales process, we try to figure out what makes a client tick. You walk their house, like, does this, like, you don't point out everything, but like, does this bother you? Does, does this nail the fact you can see the nail holes, even though they're filled, but you can see where every nail was on this piece of trim. Does that bother you? Is the, does the orange peel texture on this trim bother you? You uh, you'll point this out to them as you're going yeah, through it? You, you got to figure out what makes them tick. We, I try to spend a couple hours with the client, at least an hour. This is after, after they in have the sales process. This like, is in the sales process. Yeah. Because you, we, not, I need have to. You ever, have you never like gotten concerned? You'd say, "Hey, you know that nail? Does that nail hole bother you?" And that you would maybe kind of piss them off, like, "Hey, why are you?" It's a it's a fine line. Like you don't want to you don't want to go too far, right? I'm not here, and I'll kind of you can feel it out. It's a it's yeah. a how is this client wired? What matters to them? And you know, you know, I'm not going to point out the worst shit, the the, the little <laughs> nitpicky stuff right away. I'm going to pick out the worst stuff. Yeah. Okay. Like, I'm sorry, but I just don't understand why you fill nail holes ever. If you're going to see the nail holes later, like, but, like maybe we just don't even fill the nail holes, like hmm. basic things. Like in my world, like just, you just don't, the you fill a nail hole so that it, when you paint it, you cannot tell where the nails were. That's, I think that's in my world, that's just standard. Um, now I get that. That's not, if a client doesn't have the budget and doesn't care, they want their trim to be white. Great. But those are not my clients. Um, so in my world, you know, nail holes are a very simple thing to look at. Um, how do you feel about this? Um, you can look at cut lines on a ceiling. You can look at plaster on the ceiling. Does How does the ceiling and the wall meet? Is it wavy? Does that bother you? Um, the texture on the paint, does that bother you? Um, transitions being crisp and clean. You know, you, you can... Point out stuff and go like, does this matter? Hey, feel this trim. Is this cool? Do you, does this happy? Are you happy with this level of, you know, we see people put Regal Select on trim all the time. And that's a joke. Like, I'm sorry, but you, no professional painter, in my opinion, should ever be using Regal Select on trim. Cabinets never get me started. But I know Benjamin Moore says you can put it on trim and cabinets, but it's a non-enamel. The paint does not dry hard. It stays sticky forever. We've all held that handrail that's sticky. We've all held the door that's sticky. That's nine times out of 10. That's Benjamin Moore Regal Select, which is a great wall paint, but it's not a trim paint. And so I'll oftentimes I'll be in a house, be like, do you feel your sticky handrail? Does that bother you? Like, does it, and, and you start to like very subtly feel out what makes a client tick. And then, then we start to go like, what was your experience with painters in the past? where there's anything you didn't like, you know, and that client that I was just talking about that we've done a, a few hundred thousand dollars worth of painting now for, she, she was like, look, my husband is just exhausted with painters being in the house with contractors being in the house. We just went through this awful experience, blah, 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 blah. Now this is a great sales process that I talk about fairly frequently because I was called in to do, to paint the walls in a, in a living room. That was it. I got a phone call she already had wall swatch paint put up on the walls. She had an interior designer had like a, a document that had like wall ceilings and trim color already picked. And I was there just to paint the walls and the ceiling. And I walked out of that project selling a hundred thousand dollar restoration of that room. And this is not a woman who was very vocal, but I, I asked questions. I suggested things and I took feedback. And then I suggested more things and I took feedback and it started with the blue ceiling. And it was like, you want to make your ceiling blue. This is spec here to put a baby blue ceiling on your, in your ceiling. But you have this like disgusting plaster ceiling. That's 150 years old, giant cracks. And it's an old house, beautiful old house, but it's old. And that ceiling's like falling down. You had a big medallion plaster crown, but it was all like really old and really scarred up. And I, I just kind of was like, I don't know. Like you tell me, I'll, I'm happily paint the ceiling blue. But if we highlight this thing that's kind of ugly, is that what we want to do? She's like, oh, that's a good point. That's probably all she said. And then I was like, well, there are ways we can fix that. We can take the ceiling down and we can put a new ceiling up. And then you have smooth and then we highlight it. She's like, yeah, that sounds good. I was like, but that that's obviously costs more money. 
yeah, okay, that, that makes sense. And then, it okay, well, now you're going to have crown molding that's not going to look so great. And your medallion's not going to look so great. I said, we could try to restore it or we could have new stuff made. But that's more expensive. No, that sounds good. Okay. <laughs> and And like, I was giving options and making very clear things cost more. I'm not here to sell her on anything. I, I would have painted the room happily and moved on. I'm here to give people what they want. But when it, the sales process is trying to understand, and clearly this woman, price was not a thing she was concerned about. It was very clear after four or five, every time I give her two options, she wouldn't even talk. It was like, are you talking about money right now? I don't think, why are we talking about money? And so it evolved and evolved. And then it got to the end. And then she was like, I really can't have people in my house for a long period of time. My husband's exhausted, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, give me 24 hours. Let me figure out how fast I can get this project done. And she made it very clear by this point without ever saying anything that money wasn't the driving factor. So I said, money's out of the window. Let me call all my subs and let me beg them to come tomorrow in the middle of the summer and tell them, give me a fuck you price. I'll take it. And I did. I put together this proposal and she just she simply agreed to over a hundred thousand dollar paint job with an okay and an email and i was like <laughs> like what but i had now i had the healthy budgets i coordinated everybody we ripped the ceiling out we ripped the crown out we ripped the medallion i had the new crown already being made and and we scheduled it all and two weeks later i brought a team a huge team from connecticut that's very expensive i brought them up and two weeks later, she came back from vacation and she had two perfectly restored rooms. They are still to this day, two of the best rooms we've ever painted. And we did them in two weeks. New ceiling, new crown, new every. I mean, it was wild. But like, that's like high-end clients. Like, I no longer can say no. I, I can't put a, a money constraint on them. If they say, you know, I don't want to spend so much money in the sales process. Okay, now I can start to like, but I'm sure. never going to lead with a, a constraint. Yeah. That's, and I think that that's, that's the thing that was, took me years to, to learn. Yeah. And I think the, I mean, obviously for most people, you know, the price is no object is not the reality for them, but this idea that you don't know what your prospective customer cares about. So don't instill your values on them and then try to sell to yourself because then, yeah, you are going to hit the ceilings and you're going to be limiting yourself and, and kind of selling to your own biases Whereas most people would, would not walk in there assuming it was possible to sell a, you know, hundred thousand dollar restoration project when the project was very minimal in the beginning, yeah. but you were open and you weren't trying to do it. You weren't leading her there, but you weren't saying no either. You were open to just, Hey, what, what do you want? Okay. Here's what we can do. What do you think? And it's not just automatically, Oh, well, she would never want, they, they would never want to do that. And that applies to anyone everywhere. Right. It doesn't I think apply we just talked about this wealthy. yesterday and is. Also don't like, don't put my own stuff, but also don't put the last three clients or the last 10 mm -hmm. clients I've talked to. Don't put their stuff on this client. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's great, man. Keep an open mind. Everyone's different. And, and sometimes you will be surprised. Cause it honestly, the paint job is a part of it, but there's so many things that go in it. So to continue down this path, um, site protection is another thing. I think we do, uh, as a standard at a level that's far above what I ever did growing up as a painter, I think it's, it's a, it's a significant portion of our budgets on jobs, our site protection. Um, and, and so again, like most clients don't expect to have a paint job done and not have some dust in their house. Like it's crazy how everybody just expects that there's the paint, like the contractors are going to make some dust and it's going to, go through the house and they'll have to clean it with, with a little bit of energy and effort and time and money. Like you can mask off doors and, and stuff and you can run negative air so that literally dust cannot leave your job site, your space and go into the rest of the house. Right. I've had it as extreme as in the sales process, the client, I had one client who was pregnant, but wanted an oil-based finish everywhere in their first floor. So what we did was we ran HEPA scrubbers 24 seven for the entire project, sucking air out of the house. And, and so she stayed on the second floor. We sucked air out of the base, out of the first floor and air was just constantly coming from second floor down and out of the building. Now her HVAC costs were much higher and there was always machines running, but we made it so that she didn't smell paint on the second floor, right? If you run negative air, true negative air, where 
the air inside the space is sucked sucking from everywhere else then the rest of the house's air is going to come into that space and then out of the house and we yeah for for enough money and 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 inconvenience of noise i can make it so a client never smells paint in their house there's where yeah. there's well there's a way yeah and that happened with the first time with the client who was just like my daughter has asthma and she's super sensitive to paint smells and i was like say less I will set up an air machine. I'll put it outside your house. You know, a good HEPA scrubber is can sit outside the house and I'm going to, it's going to run 24 seven and your HVAC costs are going to go up because I'm going to be sucking so much air out of your house 24 seven. But I will guarantee you that not a speck of air that's inside my paint, the room I'm painting will ever make it inside the house. It will all go outside through filters and be blown away. You know, and if, if I don't, really spend time in the sales process asking questions and being open-minded i would never have arrived at that i might not have won that job or maybe we would have done a different scope of work yeah. but by by keeping the open mind and asking the questions and then not constraining yourself um you can do a lot you know I, there's a, a famous contractor famous build in, in newport rhode island happened like i don't know five years ago now maybe more where this like billionaire wealthy lady was like really old and she wanted to build this like i don't know what it was let's just say 30 million dollar house but she wanted it done fast and i'm gonna butcher some of this but the story is pretty cool the gc was like okay i hear you like with enough money we will build an enclosure they built they took jersey barriers those concrete barriers they like buried them in the ground they pinned scaffolding to that they built a giant scaffolding ran beams across it and they shrink wrapped a mansion so it was the weather outside didn't matter and i think i've heard stories that it was a half a million dollar enclosure temporary enclosure whatever it could have been a million but and I, i've heard a story of a very famous tech billionaire who had a mansion in newport and he built a multi-million dollar house on site so when he flew in the five times to check on the job he had a place to stay and then he tore the house down at the end like, like there, where there's a will, there's a way this GC was like, yeah, every other GC said, I can only build the house in three years. And this guy's like, I'll do it in a year and a half. Cause I'm going to literally not have a winter to deal with. So I, I think it's that idea in the high end of, of just going like, I'm not going to put financial constraints on things. Um, site protection is the thing back to what we were talking about. Like, we are going to protect things in a, in a way that's not normal. We don't use drop cloths inside houses, like period. I haven't used a drop cloth inside a house in as long as I can remember. Um, now that's not cost effective, right? Using grip right and tape and taping off and, and then throwing that stuff away. All of that takes so much more time to protect the floors than if I just laid down a drop cloth, like I did for most of my career. But it, it's, a, it's a better way of doing it it's less there's less dust it's clean it's neat it allows for a paint job to be done faster later if you spend the time now it'll, if these long like i'm not just repainting walls if you're just painting the walls in a room you know you're not just you're not going to do all the site protection that we do um but we we definitely look at site protection in a different way um yep. and and just like the level of people on a job we're going to pay pay better have better vetted people. Um, you need to take the constraints off for a high-end client. A high-end client wants to, they just want peace of mind. I think that new businesses can't serve the high-end well because you haven't been in business long enough to really be like, all right, they're going to be around. The I just got a call from like the, the pinnacle of contractors in my area. I've been trying to get in with them for four years. No luck. And then they called me out of the blue and it's like, cause of reputation and time. So I think you, the high end is also something you have to be invited into. You, there's not really, I've shortcutted it. I was probably, I probably got here as fast as you possibly can. I shortcutted it as much as you could. I over delivered and I built a, a body of work and I worked social media hard and I, I did a lot of things. I faked it till I made it in many ways. Um, but even still, I'm still, you know, I'm 13 years in, I'm, I'm six, seven years into doing this, the level we do it, I'm finally getting invited into like the, 
there's one step. There's always, there seems to be a step up. This is about as high as the steps go. And it, it's a long game as well. I think yeah. my clients aren't calling new guys. It's incredible. So with the, when you're in this elite stratosphere, so to speak of the clients that you're working with, how, how does like the day-to-day change? Obviously the, the site, um, the site protection, you know, all the other stuff you're doing is much higher level. You're removing the financial constraints. You're not saying no to anything. You're being way more open, open-minded. You understand that your clientele thinks somewhat different overall than probably the average person in the population. How about communication throughout the project? How about the sales process itself? How How is that communication different from maybe the, the lower tiers of the market? Yeah, I mean, constant communication. We, we ask our clients, how do you want to be communicated and how often? Right. Not every client wants an, a daily update. Um, few, very few of our clients want a daily update. Um, but I think understanding what makes them tick. Um, I think speed is something that you really can't underestimate. Um, as far as I mean, all people, but many people don't won't put their money where their mouth is about how speed is as matters. Right. You want to have their cake and eat it too. Yes. Act, it, it's actually funny because this I learned the other day the saying is have your cake and eat it too. Isn't that funny? Because it, it's it's like you have your cake and you get to eat it. Yeah. it, it you keep it after you eat it. Yeah. It, it took me uh it took me a long time to and that was what I, I I never like Googled it or anything. I was always like, that's a really weird saying. But I did come to that conclusion, like, well, if you ate it, then you don't have it. Yeah, it's eat your cake it's in your belly. You. Yeah. Every I've been saying it wrong my whole life. Sorry. I no, no worries, man. All that stuff. But yeah, I think it's like, I, I think Slavic has talked about how like his most profitable with a one man operation, right? A one, a one, one man or two man crew is the most profitable, efficient way to paint. And that's, I think that is very much, that makes a lot of sense why that's true. Um, and so again, like we're throwing out efficiency for, client experience oftentimes. And so, you know, if I put six, eight guys in a room, like when we did that project, that rushed project, the restoration, we had, you know, I think I had seven or eight guys in a room working. That's so inefficient. Like total hours on the job, super inefficient. Total days on the job, very efficient. And so when time is a, a, a factor, like I know when when my when that GC calls me the other day, I've built a company to serve him and his types of clients, right? I know my sales pitch is honest, but it's also exactly what he wants to hear. I have scale. I have the ability to put 25 guys on a job if you want. I have a project management. I have office staff. That's music to this guy's ears, right? The paint job has to be good. No one, this guy's not calling me if we don't have a reputation for putting out good, high quality paint jobs, but that's not enough to really serve the high end at scale. Like I also have to be able to do like projects quickly. And I think time is one of those things that you can't underestimate how much it matters to people. And if you're doing five to $8,000 paint jobs, like you're just not there very long. But as we start to do a larger scope of work, doing it in a timely manner makes a lot of sense. So that's another part of the sales process that I need to, to, to poke out from people. Cause I can definitely reduce my cost if I can also extend the amount of days I'm on site. And so I need to understand from a client where on the spectrum do you stand? If I had one guy there for six months and it was cheaper, would you take it? Or do you want a team there for two weeks? And that's an exorbitant team. That's super inefficient. Yeah, no, that makes sense, man. With the, with the level of, of, um, and, and we touched on it a little bit last time, but with the level of <laughs> precision that you have to have, you know, I know that that's not just it, you know, the project being really good is, is necessary, but not sufficient. It's a prerequisite for that contractor wanting to use you, but there's a lot more that you have to be able to back up. But with the, with the level of, of work, uh, you know, the quality of the work product still needing to be quite high for you. How do you comfortably leverage the subcontractor model and ensure that quality control is where you need it to be? 
Um, I mean, we have a school where we teach. Um, so I think ed, like training is important. Um, on, all of our subs have come through the school. It, a lot of it just to be like, yep, this guy knows what he's talking about. Or, you know, just like GCs, we're going to start them on smaller projects first and, and learn. And we've learned their capacities. Many, like not every sub, not every contractor is honest with their capacities. I know I wasn't for a very long time. Um, so part of what we have learned is like, as a, as a contractor, like my job is to understand the capacities of my subs for them. I have a couple of guys where I, I can ask them and they, they will tell me honestly what their capacities are, but I also have some subs that like, they don't quite know. And they do a lot of that, like in a perfect world estimating or in a perfect world. Yeah. I'll be done in three weeks. And it's like, Hey man, like let's spend some time. How did you arrive at that? I bet you it's more like five. Can we talk about and like, you know, I learned the hard way. Part of part of what I learned as in the sub model at the high end is like we really do need to heavily be involved in schedule and process and helping our subs understand their capacities. Um, and and honestly, the ones that understand their capacities and are honest with me, they get preferential treatment. Right. I have a couple guys who are gonna say no to me a lot. And I love that because when they say yes, I believe them. And I have, I've had some guys in the past will say yes, 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 yes. Until the world blows up and you're like, all right, I need to throttle them back. Cause this is a, this is a dog that will eat itself to death. Like I need to know, okay, what can you do? I, like, let's slow down. I'll think for you. My job in this equation is to add value to both sides, the client and the sub. If I don't add value to this, if I don't, if the sub wants to go work for the client and the client wants to work with the sub directly, I've done something horribly wrong, right? I don't have a business. So I think um, what we do for the client is we help set realistic schedules and then we advocate for what needs to happen in a way that when I was doing the painting every day, I couldn't get out up and see it from above. And I didn't have, I didn't have the bandwidth to. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, you're you're managing at the at the highest of levels and making sure everything goes exactly how it needs to go. A how lot of you, oh, go, go ahead. ahead. A lot of what we do is like we try to think because there's a manager on the project. We try to think two or three steps ahead for the GCs. I have one GC who reduces their markup for us because we have so much management. They know that they don't have to. Their their PMs don't have to spend nearly the amount of time managing the paint job or the painter as they sort of, you know, their standard, whatever, 18% markup that a GC is going to put on the sub. All right, well, we're going to come in and, and, and this it's not a lot. Some GCs that are slow, they want every dollar of markup so they can, but a lot of these GCs right now, the best ones that we work with, they're all drowning in work. And for them, it's like, Oh, this is so nice. When we hire ZK, like they're going to be proactive about schedule. They're going to be proactive about colors and sampling. And they're going to think, I think a lot of it, like I, when you're not getting paid a lot to do paint jobs, you're not getting paid to think you're just getting paid to put paint on things. And a lot of what we do now is get paid to think. Yeah. Thinking man's game. So I, I do want to kind of touch on one thing that could be confusing to people. So you, you had said, and, and a lot of people do, and it, you know, it kind of has to happen sometimes, but the fake it till you make it or say yes. Right now you say yes, but you're, it's not faking it. You say yes. And you figure it out and you actually make it work. You come back you know, give me 24 hours, come back with an honest proposal. So you actually make it work. Some people could be listening to this and they might want to follow in your footsteps or do something similar. And they might, they might lean towards saying yes. But then we said, okay, sometimes the subcontractors or other people will say yes. And the reality is it's a dog that's going to eat itself to death. They don't really have the capacity. How do you draw that line between wanting to say, Hey, I'm going to say yes and take the leap and figure it out on the way down versus you know, knowing your own limitations at that moment and maybe not being so prone to doing to that. that question. That, that's a great question. And I think that um, understanding calculated risk, right? Because your the re your reputation in the high end world is everything. The the second that's what they they're hiring you mostly off your reputation. So if you do say yes to something that if you fail at it could hurt your reputation, don't do it. Right. I think that's the difference. What I say yes to that if I fail at 
Oh, I would say now the only thing that you really want to do is the failure costs you money. If, if I agree to do something and I'm taking a risk and I may be faking it till I make it a bit, the only thing I'm comfortable losing, risking is money. I will never risk reputation or I will try not to. I think that's the big di differentiator. If I was going to look at one, it's like, if this goes bad, are you ruined reputationally or are you just going to cost you a few thousand or 10,000 or $50,000? Is it just going to cost money? Because money is something that I see on my end secretly in a PL. Reputation, outward reputation is what the world sees. And it's, everybody knows the saying, you know, it takes whatever. There's the thing about it takes years to build a reputation and it takes one second to lose it. Yeah. Right. And that is so true. I think you cannot underestimate how powerful reputation is and just do it. So, so when I see guys who are, you can't shortcut this. You can you can do some things to get places faster, but you need to understand what shortcuts you're taking and why. But if you look at someone like me and you're like, oh, I want to do that. Like you, you can't do this in a year. You can't get to where I am in a year. I'll tell you right now, it's not possible. And if you're doing it, you're going to sacrifice some things. You'll be taking risks and it's going to blow up. I, I love the analogy of you have to build in order to build a, a giant skyscraper, you have to have a solid foundation and the, the wider and the deeper you build your foundation, the higher you can build your skyscraper. You can start building a skyscraper tomorrow on dirt and you'll start building faster, right? If I start going down and building my foundation and you start building up, well, you're going to beat me for a while. But there's going to come a day where you either cap out or the thing falls over. But I've been building this deep and wide foundation to build my skyscraper that will never fall. And life is the, a long game. Like it just is. And so slow, steady effort over time, that's the secret. And so when you are taking on these risks, taking them on calculated, the number of times I talk to someone and they're like, so I sold my first gloss room. How do I do it? Like, are you fucking kidding me? <laughs> like, dude, you're screwed, bro. Like, be because it, the odds are that just financially you're going to take a hit on this are pretty slim. Now, some guys are at the level where they could do a gloss room and only take a financial hit. But for the most part, you're going to take a reputational hit. You're not going to deliver. And it's going to be, I mean, we took over, we've taken over projects where a, two gloss doors for eight months were in somebody's shop and they were still a month from being done. And where it would have taken me a month to do them. And like that person just should have said, I can't do this. Like don't agree to take a gloss door for six months and charge top dollar. We talked about this yesterday. If you're going to do your first gloss door, agree to do it. Tell them it might take six months. And that's why you're only going to pay 800 bucks. But when you take risks that can affect your reputation, if they go wrong, I think that's really the big issue. Yeah. That's great, man. Yeah, the reputation is for the long, the long game. Um, and yeah, being calculated in general. There's there's inherent risk, obviously, in business and in life and business especially, but just being calculated, what is your potential downside? If everything did not go according to plan, we all like to think optimistically. That's why we're business owners and pursuing what would really be, I think is mathematically a really a logical life choice to go start your own business. But so we're all thinking it's all gonna work out but don't plan like it's all going to work out. Hope for the best plan for the worst. If everything goes south on this, how screwed are you? Financial hit, you can bounce back from. Reputational hit, you might not bounce back from that. There's a great mental exercise called a post-mortem, post right? And before the project starts, you like they do this in, in the corporate world and in big, big, big business all the time. But you sit there and before you start the project, you have a meeting and you're like, all right, guys, the project went to shit. What was it that went wrong? And now you put your, you put a completely different hat on a different lens of seeing the project and you start to go, okay, what are the weak points in this? What are the things that can go wrong? That if, if you were to flash back, flash forward to six months and the project just went to shit, what was it? I, that's a powerful way of seeing things because it takes that optimistic view and flip and switches it. And now you start to see things of like, okay, where are the holes in this? Yeah. 
if you're if you're only looking optimistically and you're not doing post more pre-mortems i think it's called a pre-mortem that's what it is you it died and you're looking about beforehand mm, of the sense. dead what killed this person um or what killed this project and it being viciously honest is steel manning i i love that that concept of steel manning an argument steel manning the other side right we, we know straw manning is is weakly pretending but viciously steel man a, a, a problem all right be the give me all the real honest answers of why this could have gone wrong and i think that that's really valuable at at seeing and then like incrementally grow like it, you can't go from here to here like you got to incrementally get there anytime you go from here to here too fast like there, you're not going to you're not even going to know in a pre-mortem the things that could go wrong if you jump too fast right i i mean i've i've just made so many hundreds and thousands of mistakes that when i go look at this project and and tonight i'm putting together tomorrow i'm submitting a proposal for anywhere from like 4 to 6 or 700,000 when i go to look through this project i have a lot of failures and data points and things to point out and reasons why I have a lot of context to build and advocate for the paint job and the price I'm going to put on it. If I had looked at this job six, seven years ago, I could never have been able to bid it properly and then advocate for why. Yeah. So don't go there. I like I hadn't, I didn't, but I had no business doing a half million dollar paint job seven years ago. And thank God I didn't try because Guys do it, and that's what causes like the, what we talked about yesterday. The old, the worst thing you can do in business is go out of business. Just stay yeah. in business long enough, and you'll figure out you'll make the mistakes. You'll have momentum. Life will get better. I promise. I promise you. Business gets so much easier when you stay in it. It's so hard in the beginning, yeah. but yeah. you get momentum. So don't risk anything that could ever like put you out of business. Yeah, don't do a, a hail mary that you don't have to do. Business is is hard but you're listening to this podcast, which already puts you in the top fraction because you're investing into yourself and learning. And so stick with it, continue to learn, continue to grow, look around you. There are plenty of successful business owners who are not as smart as you, who are not as good as you. So stick with it over time. Don't get put out of business. Don't do crazy things. And eventually it's inevitable. You will succeed over time. There's no question. Yeah. Just don't try to... I think the this gener the younger generation really wants everything fast. Wanted it yesterday, right? And I've seen, I mean, I've I've seen guys, I've worked with guys who they're just, I'll tell you right now, they're on a, a trajectory that's not gonna end well. If if one of these guys is still in business today, I'd be shocked. And he had all the answers and he 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 thought, you know, he had no no knowledge of our industry and a and a very um a huge you know, he was way ahead of his skis. Yeah. And it was like, dude, I, you're not, this isn't going to work out for you, man. Like you got to slow down and put the work in. Like if you're not better at your boss, better than your boss, don't go start a company. Yeah. Like the day you start your company, you have to compete with your boss. So you better be better than him because he's already has momentum. He has the clientele. The, the merry go round is flying for him right now. And you got to be, you got to compete with that. So take the time. I think there, the, there is a definitely an issue. And I've talked about it plenty of times in this industry of, of like not a lot of great painting companies where you can really work your way up and learn a lot, but they do exist. If you're a great now, I thought that I didn't, they didn't exist for me because I was a terrible employee, but if you are a good employee <laughs> and a hardworking, steady person, there are great companies who are looking to hire you and give you opportunity. And once you've touched every aspect of the painting business, now go start one. You'll have a lot better chance of success. Yeah. Just going out there and, and like winging it, it. I mean, I did that and I got here, but man, it was a way harder road than if I had just spent a few more years working for a few other companies and learning. I, I It could have, it would have saved me so much time and energy. And I, where I am today would be so much farther along than where I am now. If I had just not started so soon. Yeah. The skyscraper analogy is a good one, man. Really good one. Um, all right, Zach, well, as we wrap up this second episode, really appreciate you, man. Is there anything else you want to add 
uh, before we finalize this one? No, I think this we covered it. Yeah, I love it, man. So next time we're going to be covering social media marketing greatness. I think you'll you'll enjoy um, sharing about that. I'm really excited for that. And yeah, appreciate you, man. Appreciate you opening up about so many things and all the uh, the uniqueness of the market that you serve, but also the similarities just to people in general and the psychological kind of frameworks we box, our, box ourselves into that we probably shouldn't. So thanks for getting into all that, man. You got it. If you want to learn more about the topics we discussed in this podcast and how you can use them to grow your painting business, visit paintermarketingpros.com forward slash podcast for free training, as well as the ability to schedule a personalized strategy session for your painting company. Again, that URL is paintermarketingpros.com forward slash podcast. Hey there, painting company owners. If you enjoyed today's episode, make sure you go ahead and hit that subscribe button. Give us your feedback. Let us know how we did. And also, if you're interested in taking your painting business to the next level, make sure you visit the Painter Marketing Pros website at paintermarketingpros.com to learn more about our services. You can also reach out to me directly by emailing me at brandon at paintermarketingpros.com and I can give you personalized advice on growing your painting business. Until next time, keep growing.